If a quarter of a percent to any of this, then I could boast in that quarter of a percent, right? right. I can say, God, thank you, but as far as me. Yeah. And now it's no longer grace, but it becomes debt. God, you're a debt to me to that quarter of a percent. Is it debt and grace, or is it grace and grace alone? Grace. And that's why we glory. Because it's glory in God because He provides everything that we need for our salvation. Richard? If there's anything you could do, then Christ wouldn't have had to die. It, it says He would die in vain. Amen. Right? And that's, that's what the next thing here is. But if we had to purchase it from Him, we might as well have brought it from Him in the first place and saved Him the task. If righteousness come by the law, then Christ died in vain. Galatians 2, 21. You were redeemed not with corruptible things, with silver or gold from your vain manner of life handed down from your father, but with precious blood as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, even the blood of Christ. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and 19. Leviticus tells us that the life is where? In the blood. In the blood. <clears throat> Therefore, the redemption that is in Christ Jesus is his own life. This is why it is all centered on Christ. This is why every message, every Sabbath school class has to be Christ-centered and has to have Him Amen. lifted up and glorified. Yeah. Because without Christ, nothing. nothing. It's all in vain. Mm. This is why Jesus has to be a personal Savior. My faith is not going to save you and your faith is not going to save you. Our mutual faith together can build each other up. But that's it. You have to know Jesus Christ, and I have to know Jesus Christ. So Christ set forth. Christ is the one whom God has set forth to declare his righteousness. Now since the only righteousness that is real righteousness is the righteousness of God, and Christ is the only one who has, or, who has been ordained of God to declare it upon men, it is evident that it cannot be obtained except through him. Does that make sense? Let me read it again. Christ is set forth. Christ is the one whom God has set forth to declare his righteousness. Now, since the only righteousness that is real is the righteousness of God, and Christ is the only one who has been ordained of God to declare it upon men, it is evident that it cannot be obtained except through him. Do you know what Acts 4.12 says? There is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we can what? Be saved. Be saved. Do you understand? It is always and only and will always be about Jesus Christ. Yeah. When Adam and Eve fell and God gave them in Genesis chapter 3 the prophecy of a child who would come through her. Who was God speaking about? Jesus Christ. That the devil would bruise his heel, but Christ would bruise his head. Now, was Adam saved by anything else other than Jesus Christ and faith in him? The only difference is they waited for him to come. He's already come. We believe that he has come. All of us are saved the same way. There is no difference. God has one plan of redemption, and that plan is centered, focused, and only conditioned on Jesus Christ. Yes. Here you go. Jesus was set forth as a propitiation. A propitiation is a sacrifice. The statement then is simply that Christ is set forth to be a sacrifice for the remission of our sins. Hebrews 9.26 says, Once in the end of the world has he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Of course, the idea of a propitiation or sacrifice is that there is wrath to be appeased. Right? Who's wrath? Now, I'm going to... Let's just think about this. Okay? Think about this. Now, you need to realize this was written 
and I'm going to read this, and, and, and his English is hard. Okay, so, of course, the idea of a propitiation or sacrifice is that there's wrath to be appeased. But take particular notice that it is who requires the sacrifice. That's the hard English. I'm not really sure how to translate that. I know what it means, and I'm going to explain it to you now. Okay, so, Jesus Christ was sent forth as our propitiation, as our sacrifice. Was it so it would appease the wrath of God? What is the curse of sin? Yeah. And why is there death? Because sin is the transgression of what? So what actually needs to be appeased? God or his broken law? So think about this. And, and, and Wagner, um, he states this. If God needed to be appeased from his anger and wrath, and he gives his son to appease himself of his anger and wrath, then what kind of God do we serve? It's kind of crazy, don't you think? It wasn't God's wrath that needed to be appeased. God has reconciled the world unto himself. God is a God of love. But what needed to be appeased? That was the breaking of the law. Sin leads to death. God is not the author of death. God is the author of life. And this is the thing that's going on in my head. And I'm going to try to explain it to you now. So please listen carefully as I try to actually make this as plain as possible. Let me read this first, and then I'll explain this. But take particular notice that it is who requires the sacrifice, and not God. God provides the sacrifice. Okay? God provides the sacrifice. The idea that God's wrath has to be propitiated in order that we may have forgiveness finds no warrant in the Bible. It is the height of absurdity to say that God is so angry with men that he will not forgive them unless something is provided to appease his wrath, and that therefore he himself offers the gift to himself, by which he is appeased. And you that were sometimes alien, he quotes Colossians 1, verses 21 and 22, and you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now has he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death. Think about this. Paul already has told us that we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. What is it that we fall short of? We fall short of his character. We fall short of his righteousness. Is that right? What is his righteousness that we've lost? Isn't that righteousness the perfection of his character? The perfection of his law? I need you to answer that question because this is where this is going. Okay? What does the law have to do with us today? What does the law have to do with us from the time of Adam's fall? Alright? The law has been shown in Romans and Galatians that it can't do anything to give us righteousness. Is that right? right. But is the law righteous? Yes. Is the law just? Yes. Is the law holy? Yes. Do we not need to have that just holiness inside of us? Yes. Uh -huh. And what is it that we don't have? I cannot keep the law of God because my flesh is at enmity with that law. So what I find in me is that my flesh wars against the spirit and the spirit wars against the flesh. Now think about this. What was it that Jesus actually accomplished? Jesus says, I delight to do your will, for your law is where? In my heart. Jesus Christ was the embodiment, the epitome of God's law. Is that right? Yes. Isn't it God's law? You said that it's a transcript of his character, right? It's who he is. The law is the law of liberty. It's the law of freedom, the law of love. That's what Jesus Christ is. How do I get the law to actually live inside of me when it's an enemy to me? Because all the law does is tell me I'm a sinner. And it condemns me. Do you understand now why Jesus Christ has to be the center of all of this? Because 
If Christ is the fulfillment of the law, Christ is the embodiment of the law, and if Christ is living inside of you, then what does that do for your relationship with God? What does that do for the power that comes from God to actually overcome sin? Does that make sense? Because that was really quiet. It makes you you have victory. And reconciled to God. Think about this. You've been reconciled to God. Everything that Adam forfeited has been regained in Christ. That beauty of God's law, the beauty of His character, is now really written in my heart. Why? Because God actually takes a pen and writes on my heart? No, because Jesus is living inside of me, and if Christ is in me, then all that the law requires is living in me. And living in me, it's now working through me, and it's coming out of me in works of righteousness that God had ordained before the creation of this world. Amen? Does that make sense to you? Yes. This is what Christ has come for. This is righteousness by faith. This is the message that Jones and Wagner were, were given. Or was it? Were given. This is why the Adventist church is still here today, because God is wanting a people to proclaim this message, but we can't proclaim it until we believe it. And we can't live it until Christ is living in us with power. Amen. Start the leadership. Wow. When that happens, and when God has a people that are not asleep, that are actually awake, who actually say, I see this. I'm starting to grasp this. I see what the power of Christ inside of me can do. Then I believe in the beginning of the latter rain will be poured out again. You know it was poured out many, 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 many decades ago. And God wanted to come back. God has now brought us back to focus on this. God has now brought us back to the very gates of the promised land. The question is, is will we make the same mistake as our forefathers or will we finally trust Him and accept Him and submit to what He's called us to do? Our closing hymn this morning is hymn number 287.
Father, I thank you for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, that you have justified us freely, that we can bring nothing but our hearts and say, thank you. I accept this gift. Father, I pray that you will open our hearts and you will wake our souls, that we will be that last generation that we will trust the Holy Spirit in everything that we do. That, Father, we will have not just the faith of a mustard seed, but that we will have the faith of Jesus Christ. Amen. And that we will live by that faith. Father, I pray that the world will see something in us that they so desperately want. Father, I know they're looking for us. I also know Pray, dear Lord, that you would touch our hearts, that you will wake us from our slumber, and that you will help us to put away our sin that separates us from you. Father, forgive us, change us, strengthen us. Father, I pray that you will use us to bring this last day message to the entire world so that Jesus can come back. And this I ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah.